Do not forget my story, Senua. I am with you still. Out of hell you have come, and now find yourself in Midgard, the world of man. Do not think it any less dangerous for that. Your path has taken you far from home, across the boundless sea, and you must go on to the heart of this place, to the heart of man. You have seen how the Northmen journey out to conquer, and this is one of their lands, as icy dark as Niflheim, yet as fiery as Muspel. It has not long been claimed, and they try still to tame it. The Skald's verse speaks of a man called Grettir the Strong. A strange and bloody life he led. And it happened in this land you have come to. Listen to his story, Senua. For it may in some small way illuminate your own. The Skalds say that in Grettir's time, a nearby farm was plagued by hauntings. A shepherd called Glamour was killed by some evil force, found dead in the snow, bloated and black. His body could not be taken to burial because he was held fast to the ground. So it was left. Three days after his death, the body was missing. The Skalds tell how the revenant glamour roamed the settlements, terrifying all those who lived there. Each one he killed, in turn, rose to walk beside him. Thus, evil begets evil. But the man Grettir was proud and overbearing, and thought the Droiger no match for his strength. Skalds say that Grettir fought and killed the Droiger Glamour, but not before Glamour him. His strength would be turned against him. His deeds bring death and exile. And he would be always before Grettir's eyes, making him afraid to be alone. He saw all sorts of phantoms wherever he looked. And thus, people who see things that aren't there are said to have glamour's eyes. tell how in the time of Grettir's kinsman Thorgrim there was a terrible famine. No crops could be grown and the fish fled the nets. It lasted years and the people were desperate. There was no respite even in spring since terrible gales from the north would rise up and set in for weeks. This is a cold and unforgiving land, Sinoa. Thorgrim found a huge finback whale, beached and dead. His neighbor, Thorfinn, had already found it and was in the process of flensing it. But Thorgrim claimed it as his own. Thorfinn said he would not give it up without a fight. If that's what you want, Thorgrim said, let it be so. And he launched a blow at Thorfinn, cutting off his head in one strike. Skalds say that the neighbors fought, armed only with the knives and axes they had brought to cut up the whale, even picking out the whale ribs to beat down their enemies. Thorgrim's men had loaded their boats with whale meat, but as they went to leave, one of their opponents struck Thorgrim's brother a fatal blow. And this is how hunger fates desperate men to come to blows, striking out against one another to survive. The 
scores speak of the time Grettir, traveling with some others, ran into rough weather and docked their boat on an island. They had not brought fire with them, and the merchants complained bitterly. Seeing a great fire blazing on the other side of the strait, Grettir said he would swim over to fetch it. He took off his clothes and struck out across the water, wearing nothing but a cloak. When Grettir came to the farm where the fire was burning, all was peaceful. By the time he reached them, his cloak was frozen stiff, and he looked like nothing more than some huge troll. The frightened farmhand struck out at him with the first things to hand, the burning logs from the fire. Grettir fought them off and got the fire he sought. But the sparks from the logs spread fire all over the house, and nobody survived the blaze. The Skalds say that Grettir swam back across the strait, keeping the fire safe from the water. His friends applauded Grettir's bravery, but when word spread about the massacre at the farm, people took against Grettir. Nobody wanted anything to do with him, and when the news reached the Althing in the summer, Grettir was pronounced an outlaw. All doors would hence be shut to him. Grettir, now an outlaw, took rest on the island of Haramsoy with a man called Audun. Grettir saw a great yellow glow like a fire rising from the ground. Audun told him it was coming from the burial mound of Carr the Old, who ever since he died had haunted the island, and warned him to stay away. The Skalds say, Grettir wanted the sword that was buried in Carr's how, and would not be deterred from seeking it. He broke the mound open and started digging until he reached the timber props. By this time it was night. Audun warned him again not to continue, but Grettir threw down a rope and went inside the mound. No light penetrated it, and it reeked of death, but he persisted in exploring. Grettir found the sword he was seeking, Carr's loom, buried in the grave mound. He went to leave, but before he could reach the rope, something grabbed him from behind, and Grettir realized the mound dweller would not let his treasure go. The two fought ferociously, until Grettir got the advantage and chopped off the revenant's head. But Carr's loom would prove his undoing, fated to be the sword that killed him. The Skald's verse tells how Grettir made many enemies with his proud and overbearing nature. Always quick to anger, his strength and fighting prowess meant that even the most trivial of quarrels met a fatal end. The kinsmen of those he killed or maimed were angry, and because he was an outlaw, no one was allowed to help him. The outlaw Grettir fled to the island of Drangi. His enemies knew he was there, but he was still so strong and fierce, nobody could shift him. Thorbjorn, first among his foe, sent his foster mother to see Grettir. She was a Saithkona, and very wily. She enchanted a tree branch and sent it to wash up on Drangi. Grettir tried to cut it up for firewood, but his axe flew back and struck him in the leg. The wound blackened and festered, and Grettir feared his time was close. The Skalds say Grettir, wounded by Sather, was now so weak it was possible for his enemies to defeat him. Under cover of night, Thorbjorn and his men attacked his shelter. They tried to disarm him, 
but he clung so firmly to his sword, Kar's loom, that they had to cut off his arm to get it free. Then they used his sword to cut off his head, and the land's mightiest outlaw was dead. As the Droiger glamour had predicted, all Grettir's brave and fine deeds brought him misery. So fate makes prisoners of us all. But it was Grettir's nature that made him fight the Droiger. And Grettir's nature that led to blood feud and exile. So what is truly our prison, Senor? Is our path ordained? And we powerless to change it? Or do we blame uncertain powers for what we ourselves ordain? In all the places of the earth, they know that the gods and spirits affect man's path. All the misfortune that befalls man lies at their feet. If you have eyes to see, you see their presence and their power. Keep your eyes open, traveler, and you might see their faces. Here, they once said that Loki lies imprisoned in a cave, trapped by his enemies, who set a serpent above to drip venom on his face. His wife, Sigyn, sits beside to catch the venom in a bowl, but when she must leave to empty it, the poison falls unabated. His pain is so great that he thrashes and writhes, and here above we see the earth shake and break apart. Across the sea, they know that the earth is carried in the arms of a giant. When he is vexed or injured, he may not carry his burden so gently, and the world will feel his anger. In a land far away, they say the winds are trapped beside the earth. They try always to make their escape, and they buffet and beat on the walls of their prison, causing the earth to quiver. And when they break through, they make their escape. They explode out in fury. In the lands of your birth, people live hidden too in the hills and stones. They may be the remnants of a godly race who lost a war with giants and, finding the world changed, retreated into silence. You still see their carvings in circles from the time when they walked among men. Here, strong and wise and good, they may hear your plea and send you aid. If you are not, or if you do not respect the strictures they lay down, you might have your strife doubled. In the lands of your birth, and in these lands too, they know that people can be taken by the secret you are not careful and do not keep to the pathways, you may find yourself among them. In a land to the east, they know that when a traveler finds themselves lost, it is the fault of the Vadadash, who wait at the crossroads to trick souls passing by. The only remedy is to let your horse lead you home, because beasts have no soul. But if you have no horse, your 
your soul is lost forever. In this place, they know that sometimes the hidden folk will take their children and leave another in their place. These children may look the same as their own, but will be dazed and far away or ill-tempered. And you know then you have a changeling in your house. In this land, many people cannot raise their children. They will leave them in a sacred place for the hidden folk to take and care for. Sometimes these children come back, but it is said changed with a wildness in their eyes and their parents do not want them these people know that children who have died uncared for can return as Ultburgur small ghosts clad in fluttering rags when there are storms they may cry as they did when they were human and will look for their mothers until they find them and never leave them again. In this land, you may catch sight of the Landesir, the spirits who embody the sacred places, the rivers and rocks. You see the Lady of the Mountain, the Fiat Kuna, who bathes in the waterfall and lets the drops In the heart of the Northlands, they know the storms are born of the Oshkuredi, the hunt of Odin. The huntsmen ride horses with eyes of fire. Their weapons clash like thunder, and it is best to hide inside, lest your spirit be called to join them. the waves of the roiling winter ocean with her black thorn staff. She strikes the ground to destroy the shoots of growing green, so the winter will lie long and low on the land. These people know that the sea god, Ron, sets out nets to trap sailors and drag She sends the waves, her daughters, to wreck boats so she will have more men to take. And jealously, she pulls them down beneath the water. People here speak of warriors who can transform themselves into bears when they are enraged. Their skin becomes hide so thick, no sword or spear can break it. When King Hlofer fought Skold, many people saw a great bear fighting beside him, who killed more men with its paw than any five soldiers. Men here will tell of how Jarl Hakon worshipped the giant Durgerda and sought her aid in the middle of battle when the tide was turning against him. Fleeing to an island, he pleaded with her for aid. She demanded a sacrifice. She rejected all of his offerings until he at last killed his own son in sacrifice. Durgerda gave aid and Hakon's enemies saw the giant striding amongst the ships, arrows flying from every finger and never missing their mark. Their morale was sapped and Harkon won his battle. <laughs>